Okay, welcome to lecture 14, the Stokes theorem. It's entitled Stokes theorem relating line integrals to surfaces, just like the divergence theorem related surface integrals to volume integrals, the Stokes theorem relates line integrals to surface integrals. So let's take a look at how that works. It generalizes the definition of the curl where we defined it before for these very small areas and instead looks at it in sort of a more global or larger scale perspective. And what it does is it relates the integral over any line integral that's a closed path and relates that to an area integral over any area that's bounded by the path. So you can think of putting a soap bubble across the uh, region where the closed boundary path is. You can imagine putting a rubber sheet there. You can imagine deforming the rubber sheet in any particular way that you like. All of these different kinds of surfaces, they all are governed by the Stokes theorem. So it's a really a very general theorem. And what it says is the line integral over that closed boundary path, where I'm taking the vector field dotted into the unit tangent vector, is equal to the integral over the capping surface of the curl of f dotted into the normal vector that is the normal vector we use to relate the surface area of a small patch that we draw on the surface as we then sum up all of the different patches to create the total surface area. So we have this line integral over a closed boundary that we're denoting by lowercase s, and it turns out that that's equal to the integral of the curl over the surface denoted by big S of what's called the capping area. And t hat is the unit tangent vector along the closed boundary path, and n hat is the unit normal vector to the surface. The proof essentially just starts from the definition that we had about the curl and uses the same strategy we used for the divergence theorem. We break up the surface into many small paths and areas, and for each of those small paths, we already showed the integral over that small path of f dot t was equal to the integral over the area of del cross f dot n. Now, if you think carefully, what we actually showed was the integral of f dot t divided by the area was equal to the curl, and so now we're taking that we're taking that area element, which is represented by the vector n hat times ds, and we're dotting that into the curl. We're sort of multiplying both sides by the area, if you like, but because it's a vector, we have to convert that vector into a scalar in order to be able to compare the two sides. And when we do that, then all we have to do is we have to add up all the patches. So when we add up the patches for the uh, line integrals, what we find is all the interior paths cancel, as shown in the figure on the left. Uh, I'll be going down one of those interior lines in red in one direction, and then going up and in the other direction, and so those integrals will always cancel, whereas the integrals over each of the individual areas are going to all add. And that then yields this integral form, which says the line integral over the closed surface of f dot t is equal to the integral over ds of del cross f dot n or curl of f dot n. Really the only subtlety here in this and the only part that we haven't uh, shown in great detail but you're going to have a homework problem that shows it is the fact that when I multiply by the area that really corresponds to taking the dot product with this unit normal vector to the area multiplied by ds and then we add up all of those pieces together. Okay, that's basically it. That's Stokes' theorem. There isn't really much more to say about it. You, the hard part was done in last lecture where we worked out the details for the definition of the curl and how one gets that from these integrals. Let's take a look now at some examples of curl because curl is something that people tend not to have a very good natural feel for it. And we like to say it involves rotation, but it's actually a bit more subtle than that. And in fact, it's not very easy to immediately look at a vector field and say, oh yes, this has curl, or oh no, this doesn't have curl. So let's take a look at some examples. Our first example is the one where we have this clear rotation, minus y times the unit vector in the x direction, plus x times the unit vector in the j direction. 
Anyone who looks at this says this rotates. That appears to be completely clear. What is the curl? It's del cross F, which in this case, because I only have an I hat and a J hat, it will only have a component in the K hat direction. Let's just look at the component in the K hat direction. Uh, it's going to be the derivative of Fy with respect to X minus the derivative of Fx with respect to Y. Well, Fy is equal to X. So D by DX of X is just 1. And fx is equal to minus y, so d by dy of fx is minus 1, but there's a minus sign in the definition of the curl, so I end up getting 1 plus 1, which is 2, and this curl is just equal to 2 times the unit vector in the z direction. All right, let's look at another example. This example is minus y times j hat, the unit vector in the y direction. I have these vectors that increase the farther away I get from the x-axis, and they all point toward the x-axis. Anyone who's looking at this says this doesn't rotate, except possibly something weird happening at the x-axis where the direction changes sign. The curl is del cross f, is d f y dx minus d f x dy. fx is 0, so that term doesn't appear at all. f y is y. So d by dx of y is 0, and indeed the curl is 0 for this. So this satisfies our notion that something that doesn't look like it rotates has a curl that is equal to 0. Unfortunately, that doesn't work all of the time. Let's take a look at this example, which looks very similar to the one that we just looked at. Its absolute value of x times j hat looks quite similar to what we looked at before. I have these vectors all pointing in the same direction. They're increasing in size. There isn't even a turnaround here because I took the absolute value. I don't really need to do that. I just did that to further emphasize that this thing isn't rotating at all. However, when we evaluate the curl, what we see is Fy is equal to is equal to absolute value of x. So d by dx of absolute value of x is equal to. I'm I'm sorry. I think I have a minus sign error here. It's equal to the sine of x, and so this is equal to k hat times the sine of x. I apologize. There's a sign error in this expression, and so that's not zero. There is no fx, so the dfx dy is zero. So there's nothing to cancel this term. And so it has a non-zero curl, although it doesn't look like it rotates at all. So the notion of curl is uh, a bit subtle. It doesn't always have to rotate, although it's usually a good rule. So here we've seen an example of something that doesn't look like it rotate, but has a non-zero curl. Let's take a look at the next example, which is even more painful in some sense, uh, if you like to think of curl as associated with rotation. We take that nice rotating vector field and we divide it by the square of the radius. That really makes the vectors get very small the farther away I go from the origin. So in the center, you can see this nice little vortex or swirling motion. But the farther away I get, you can see that it dies off pretty quickly. Let's go ahead. I mean, anyone who looks at this, nevertheless, will say this clearly rotates. But when we evaluate the curl, so I'm going to take the derivative of fy with respect to x. So fy is x over x squared plus y squared. That has two terms. When I take the derivative with respect to the x in the numerator, I just get 1 over x squared plus y squared. When I take the derivative of the x squared plus y squared in the denominator, I get a minus x over x squared plus y squared quantity squared. And then I have the derivative of x squared, which is 2x. So I get a net of minus 2x squared over x squared plus y squared quantity squared. Now when I do the same thing in the y direction, the y direction when I take, I'm sorry, when I take dfx by dy, that has a minus y over x squared plus y squared, but the curl has a minus sign in the definition. So when I take the derivative of that with respect to y, I end up with 1 over x squared plus y squared. And then when I take a derivative of the denominator, it ends up being minus 2y squared over x squared plus y squared quantity squared. You want to make sure, maybe even pause the video, make sure that you can verify that that is indeed exactly what you get when you evaluate the curl. You have to make sure to put in that minus sign in front of the dfx by dy in order to get it to work. But that is the net result. Now let's add it together. I can group together the 1 plus x squared, 1 over x squared plus y squared and the 1 over x squared plus y squared. I get 2 over x squared plus y squared. If I group together the other terms, I'll get 2 times the quantity x squared plus y squared over x squared plus y squared squared. 
That has a factor of x squared plus y squared in the numerator and in the, de the denominator. I can cancel those, and I'm left with minus 2 over x squared plus y squared. That cancels the first term. And so the net result is that this thing has zero curl. And so even though it obviously looks like it rotates, it has zero curl. So the net effect of trying to relate curl to rotation doesn't always work. It usually works, but you really have to be careful with that notion because there are clear circumstances where I have things that don't look at all like they rotate, but they have non-zero curl. And I have things that obviously look like they rotate, but they clearly have zero curl. So curl and rotation are not exactly the same, although you'll hear many textbooks saying they are effectively the same. Nevertheless, it is a reasonably good rule of thumb for most vector fields that if you see a rotation, it probably has a non-zero curl, and if you don't see a rotation, it probably has a zero curl. Okay, that is all that we have for this lecture.